Turning now to other matters, independent labor journalist and occasional MMN correspondent Kim Kelly is out with a brand new book about labor history. It's called Fight Like Hell, and it tells the story of all the people who've helped build the labor movement in the U.S., particularly those names that have been lost to history. Women, people of color, the disabled, LGBTQ+, and the poor. Those who gave their lives so that workers can have some dignity in this country. Caught up with Kim to talk about her new book and the current moment for labor. This is a portion of our discussion, the full interview. So Kim, your book is chock full of individuals throughout history who have made an impact on the labor movement, who have advanced it, who have sacrificed uh, for it. Did any one or a couple individuals stand out to you that were your favorites, people you maybe particularly felt a connection to, stories that uh, were particularly enthralling to you? Just wanted to highlight maybe one or two stories from this book that's got, you know, a hundred in them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's, I mean, they're all my favorites. They're all my children, right? But um, there are a few people and moments that were especially satisfying and fun to write about. And really the, the chapter on disabled workers, that one was really personal to me because not only was it an intersection I didn't know that much about going into it, because the disability rights movement and the labor movement tend to be presented as these sort of siloed uh, entities, not necessarily uh, as, with, as in working in concert with one another. But they totally always have been. And when I went into that chapter, I was like, okay, I'm going to learn some stuff and also learn a little bit about my people, right? Because I'm a disabled person and I really only knew about the, the labor aspect of the disability rights movement and disability history through coming up in the sideshow. And I was really stoked that I got to include a little bit of sideshow history in the book. And talk about performers like, you know, General Tom Thumb and Daisy and Violet Hilton, Millie Christine, Julia Pastrana, like all of these workers, entertainers, disabled people who covered all these different intersections were treated very differently throughout their lifetime. And we're part of this moment and time when, you know, part of the conversation around disabled workers and disabled folks in the workplace is like, you know, we have to fight for all the same all the same stuff that non-disabled people deal with, like wages and working conditions, benefits. But we also, at one point, had to fight to get into the workplace to start with. Like, we weren't allowed to have jobs. The only place you could go if you wanted to earn some money was the sideshow. And that was important for me to incorporate just because not only, like, have I performed at Coney Island, I think it's a little piece of labor history that hasn't really come to light before. And like some of the people specifically in that chapter that jumped out to me when I was writing about it, about uh, the 70s, the Section 504 protest, 1977, when disabled activists like Judy Human and Kitty Cohn and Brad Lomax, they led these massive federal occupations for, in San Francisco, they lasted 26 days. And these occupations and Protests were predominantly led by women, queer women, people of color, folks that were not only disabled, but were dealing with these other structural oppressions on top of it. And they pulled off something incredible. And they were able to keep those protests going thanks to organizations like the Black Panthers, who came out and fed the protesters, like local church groups who came out and showed support. The Mashness Union in D.C. showed up and provided transportation when the activists went out there to talk to Congress. It just showed learning more about the Section 504 protests, that group of activists really just showed how much the labor movement has been part of every movement for justice in this country, whether you're talking about, you know, the Black Power movement or the feminist movement, the queer rights movement, the disability rights movement, like it's all we've always been here. Every type of worker has always been here. And I know that's not quite one or two people, but. That's one well, of my favorite sections. Yeah, it was a great. It's a great section. I mean, it starts off talking about you know the 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 circus and the sideshow and the way you the way you you draw that to the modern fight for disability rights and you you connect all these struggles throughout the book several times. Um, why is a book like this? Why does it need to be written? And I ask that in the sense of. You know, it's 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 this untold history of American labor, which suggests that these stories have been forgotten, that these people who were very prominent at the time they lived and, uh, you know, shook the earth 
why aren't they taught about in schools? I mean, I have my theories, but I'm curious <laughs> what yours are. Well, yeah, in terms of being taught about in schools, a lot of them were radical. A lot of them were going up against the established class order and trying to, you know, tear down economic and structural oppressions. Like a lot of them were socialists and anarchists and communists. Like that's a piece of the history of the labor movement that some people in the labor movement don't like talking about. And, you know, someone like Lucy Parsons, who was like the one of the most famous women of her day and certainly the most famous woman of color of her day. She's now someone that, you know, folks know about her, but you probably already have to be involved in radical circles or have an interest in radical history to know who she was and what she did. And back in the day, she was like, (laughs) uh, I'm bad with pop culture, but she was like a celebrity, infamous. And it's so important for folks to learn about people like Lucy Parsons and Baird Rustin and, you know, Dorothy Lee Bolden, all of these really radical militant labor leaders who refuse to accept what they were handed and refuse to accept the place that society stuck them into. And, you know, my education growing up when it come, come, came to history, let alone radical history, was pretty lacking and pretty, from a pretty rural, isolated place. We didn't have a lot of books. I kind of had to come do all this learning and education on my own by going to the library, by meeting people, by doing all the things that curious kids do. And, um, you know, when it comes to saying, talking about the untold aspect, like, of course, these stories are not untold as in no one's ever told them, like the workers told them. Contemporary journalists who were there on the scene helped amplify them. Uh, Historians and academics and archivists and academic researchers, like they dug up all these pieces and preserved them and made it available for people to dig through if they can find them. The trouble is that a lot of these narratives and these stories, these biographies aren't readily accessible to every person, to every worker. Even when I was trying to research this book, I ran up up against a bunch of kind of brick walls because I don't have an academic email address. You know, I'm not part of any academic institution. So there were some things I just couldn't get to, whether it were archives or like very expensive academic books. Like I had to rely on some friends in the academy to send me screenshots and send me PDFs. Like there's so many incredible history projects and books and articles out there that do tell these folks stories, but they're just not accessible to everyone. And I wanted to write something that pulled together all of these different people and moments and show the way they fit together and show the way that there were tensions and there were solidarity and there's intersection between all these different things happening and kind of package it in a way that was approachable and easy to read and very clear that, you know, even if there is this predominant narrative of who a worker is, who a union member is, usually in the mainstream narrative, it's guys like my dad, white guy in a hard hat. But I wanted to make it very clear that every other type of person has been here the whole time and done really incredible things. So not only have we always been here, like we're here now too. And I wanted this to be kind of an inspiring look at all the people that came before and have that serve as, you know, a little bit of inspiration for folks now who are interested in organizing, joining the organizing wave, unionizing the workplace, doing something to fight back. And your book really breaks down that stereotype of of the uh, white hard hat male union worker because it's it's full of stories of women, black, brown, LGBTQ, indigenous workers who have helped advance the struggle throughout uh, throughout history. Uh, there's also a section in there on the Wobblies. Um, I will occasionally see people uh, online. I, you know, I'm online a lot, and uh, <laughs> I'll see people talk a lot of shit about the IWW, and I'm not saying that any labor organization is above criticism and their tactics, you know, uh, you know, can't be discussed, but given the history of this organization and the way that the U S government absolutely went to war against the, the organizers within it and just against the organization itself, like you almost got to give them a pass a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, like when the entire U.S. government comes after you and raids your offices and destroys your archives and arrests hundreds of your leaders and imprisons some of your most effective and beloved organizers or deports other ones or chases them out and actively seeks to crush your organization. Not even that long ago, like 1917, 1918, a lot of the Wobblies that were arrested during the Palmer raids during that 
kind of persecution era, whether it was Maria Key or Eugene Debs or Ben Fletcher, like they were stuck in jail for years <laughs> just because they were anti-capitalist. They were organizers with the IWW. They were sympathetic to the idea of the one big union. They dared to speak out against the war. Like they did all of the same things that Wobblies now do. And, you know, a lot of union members now do. And the entire government was like, oh, no, we can't do this. You're too radical. You're too subversive. Like, you you must be stopped. Like, no other union has had to go through that. Like, sure, there's definitely been ways of government repression that's targeted other union members. And surely the whole Red Scare eras did not help when it came to uh, the more left-leaning or militant or radical unions, especially like between the 30s and the 60s and well, even now, it's not a it's not a great time ever to be a radical in any movement. Right. But the IWW, like the fact that they're still around and they're still organizing and they're still to, like, I should say, we I have a red card, you know, like <laughs> ideologically, at least the IWW speaks to me more than any other union. And I think that, you know, that message and that, you know, the uh, the idea of solidarity unionism, the idea of building power directly, like those are not ideas to be trifled with or thrown away or ignored like the wobblies have done incredible things throughout history and they're still doing stuff now i had one like, one one friend um once described the his idea of the wobblies to me as um civil war reenactors and i thought that was so me <laughs> for multiple reasons but the idea that the iww is this defunct or like dusty organization that doesn't have an impact on the modern labor landscape is just wrong. And it's really rude because there are a lot of really dedicated wobbly organizers out there doing things, organizing workers, like keeping the dream of the one big union alive. Well, you can, you know, easily draw a connection uh, between the current Starbucks organizing campaign. And that started by the IWW uh, you uh. Know, a couple decades ago. Also the IWW is behind a new organizing campaign at a target. Uh, store. Yes. They organized a, a burger joint out in Portland. So yeah, they're still they're still doing work. Uh, where where do you think we are right now in terms of of the labor movement? Because I feel like there's a constant tension between. It's undeniable that there have been some historic victories in new energy that hasn't existed, at least since you know I've been aware of this of this of this struggle. Um, uh, and been on this beat covering labor stories uh, that that's worth something. It seems like there's something there. And then on the other side, like if you look at history and unionization rates and strike activity, it's like, it's not shit. You know, where we are right now is not shit. But, numbers aren't good. The numbers right. are not good. So like how relevant are those numbers now, given like the new the new way that labor relations exist in the U S I wonder, and I guess just the simple question, where are we right now? How can we judge where we are and where we're going as far as the labor movement goes? I think the fact that there is so much energy and interest and optimism swirling around the union, I think that's significant because like you said, like throughout, throughout my time covering and paying attention to labor, really throughout my lifetime, labor has been on the back foot. Like the numbers have not been good. Density, union density is kept going down year by year. It's, you know, the movement is a shadow of its former self in a lot of ways. But, but I think things are changing a little bit. I mean, and I'm sure like labor historians and economists and people that are like study this for a lot longer than either of us, like I'm sure they would have a much more useful take, right? But like as someone who was excited about labor and wrote a whole big book about labor and I spent a lot of time thinking about how we got here, I think this is a pretty unique moment, like a historic moment. I mean, you public support for unions is at a record high, and that's not nothing. You know, younger people uh, are getting more excited about the idea and are doing the organizing and taking control in their, um, into their own hands. I mean, the Starbucks drive, that's an easy one to, to touch on because it's so successful and so visible, visible, but that movement is being led by young workers, by queer and trans workers, black and brown workers, like an entire new generation of organizers being minted as we speak, forged in the flames of Howard Schultz's continual public gaps. <laughs> And it's also visible and it all feels there's so much energy that I do hope that it sticks. I hope that more people follow their lead and follow the lead of the Amazon Labor Union, follow the lead of this current crop of workers organizing in different industries. 
and of people fighting and striking and bargaining contracts and doing all of the hard work that comes with being in a union and building collective power. I do have a little bit of a Pollyanna view on these things, I guess. But I mean, we've been we've been here before, like throughout history. There have been these moments where people are waking up and organizing and fighting like almost every century, every decade or so, something cool happens. And we're in it's we're in a moment where I'm feeling pretty stoked to see what comes next. And I do hope the fact that we have this probably very brief window of not Republican power everywhere <laughs> means that the NLRB, National Labor Relations Board, will continue going hard. They'll continue sending out these memos that show that, you know, captive audience meetings were not a big fan. Joy Silk, maybe that's something we could, we could bring back, you know, adding more funding, bringing on more staff and more money so they can continue running these elections and actually fighting for workers. Like, I'm always wary to place any faith in any government institution, right? But the NLRB has been a very bright spot of hope. And I think we have this small window to really build something, something big. And I have faith that the current wave of workers doing that organizing can get us there as long as everyone else gets out of their way. <laughs> Look, you're not going to see me defending Joe Biden on this show, but the appointments yeah. he's made to the National Labor Relations Board, in particular, General Counsel Jennifer Abruzzo, yes, is, a queen. <laughs> like, is, is remarkable and uh, is really... Um, achieving material gains for workers out there who are trying to organize organize yeah. their shops. Like it pains me to to give it to any politician, right? Especially at that level. But you do not have to hand it. To I certainly will not. I will be handing nothing to that man. But shout out to the Labor Relations Board. Everything happening there is very cool and inspiring. And as much as it is, as it's like maybe it seems a little wonky or nerdy to be like, well, this government agency is actually doing some cool stuff. Like. It does matter. It does have an impact, especially if we can get rid of captive audience meetings. I think it was, um, I'd have to double check, wasn't it Apple store workers with CWA just brought like kind of a trial balloon case against uh, against Apple or whatever evil people they're dealing with being like, hey, captive audience meetings are illegal. Like we should get rid of them. And if that goes through, that's going to be a game changer. Like even taking away a little bit of power from the union busters in a real way, like that might that might change things, you know? It's kind of like, I'm <laughs> trying not to curse too much. It's kind of bonkers to think that right now it is legal for an employer to pull you off the shop floor, pull you in from your office and sit you down and tell you for hours why unions are bad and why you shouldn't vote for one. Like, then lie to you straight to your face and lie to your coworkers. Like, that is ridiculous that people are allowed to just do that. And even if we can just get rid of that, then like, I will hand that to Joe Biden. Just that. Uh, <laughs> one of the takeaways that I got out of this book is, and that probably anyone reading the book will get, is that these struggles never end. Um, you the, the book is broken up into sections where you, you look at the struggles within mining, the miners, and then farmers, and transportation workers, and so on and so on. And those labor struggles are still going on today. We got the United Mine Workers uh, down in uh, Alabama who've been on strike now. As you know, who you've been <laughs> you've been down there several times. We're now over a year uh, against their bosses at Warrior Met Coal. Um, you know, both within these realms where these battles have already been taking place for for a hundred years. Where where are the future labor fights? And I, and I mean that both within the, these battles as well as new battles where we're just now starting to see organizing fights. If this book is written 50 years from now, what are the stories, the leaders and the the arenas where these fights are taking place that'll be highlighted? I think there's probably going to be a lot more about Amazon. <laughs> and I also think something that even just thinking, I'm kind of spitballing thinking about future things, but I think hopefully we'll see there'll be a chapter on the climate and on the way the labor movement has responded to the crisis and the way that workers have been involved in those processes. Because I mean, I think just the other day, uh, Greenpeace and a bunch of members of the steel workers came together for a protest. Um, gosh, I'm trying to remember the details. This is probably a terrible example to bring up now because I can't remember them. But there's essentially like a protest and action happened where people from Greenpeace and steel workers working in, I think, the oil, uh, oil industry came together and kind of we're working in solidarity and talking about how workers who are in industries like oil or coal, fossil fuels in general, extractive industries in general that are harming the planet, like 
they're not people that we can afford to leave behind or throw scraps or just say, oh, learn to code. Like that is not a sustainable and equitable way to approach that issue. And I think hopefully we'll see more overlap and understanding and solidarity between movements like you know, the climate justice movement, the labor movement, like racial justice movement, like queer and trans rights, like all of these issues that regular workers are dealing with all the time because of who they are and where they work and what they do. Like, I think showing that those intersections are there and they're growing and that labor stories really encompass every other kind of story too. Like, because if you think about it, most, if not all, I'll say most, most people, almost everyone either has a job or is going to have a job or did have a job. And working like selling one's labor for profit and for to cover one's basic needs is one of those almost universal experiences and that's not going to go away no matter what happens with the the gig economy no matter what happens in tech or in media or in new emerging industries that we don't even know about yet that they're going to show up and blindside us in three years like <laughs> the one constant throughout the history of the movement and of labor in this country is change and progress and setbacks and movement. I think that, you know, it's kind of hard to say what's coming in the future, but I hope that, you know, the next edition in 50 years will have a chapter on Chris Smalls and Derek Palmer and about Isaiah Thomas in, in Bessemer, who's trying to organize the Amazon workers there. I hope that I hope that I, I learn a lot in the next few years. I hope that I'm surprised. I hope that people catch me off guard because, you know, the surprises are all the fun happens. Like I don't want to pretend to predict anything because I'm just kind of along for the ride too, you know? <laughs> yeah. Aren't we, aren't we all? And it would be nice to see some, some more struggle in the arena of anti-imperialism too. I, I mm. come across some stories about British dock workers and the role they played in stopping arms shipments to, um, to Chile, uh, when, when Pinochet came to power and yeah, there's a great documentary about that. I think they're in, uh, I think they're Scottish and I mean, also yeah, that's we've right. Seen, yeah. Yeah. And we, I mean, we've seen, there are some unions that aren't afraid to do that sort of thing too. Like, especially in the docks on the West coast, the ILWU, uh, international Longshore and warehouse workers union, like they're not afraid to strike over political issues and to call out, you know, it's like imperialist efforts, like, there are people who are willing to make those calls and talk about it. It's just, I think a lot of, mm, let's see, we'll say labor leaders, people in power in the movement itself are a little reluctant to veer away from established democratic party talking points and anti-imperialism gets complicated for people that see the world that way. So I would love to see the rank and file getting a little bit louder about, you know, international struggles. Well, the book is called Fight Like Hell. Kim, it's uh, quite an achievement. Uh, you, uh, look at that. It's an achievement here. It's a great book. I encourage everybody to go and get themselves a copy, preferably at a local independent bookstore. Uh, Kim Kelly, uh, any final thoughts? Anything else you want to say before we wrap this up? Mm, I think I want people to remember that solidarity is our greatest weapon. We've won before. We will win again. And no matter who you are, where you come from, how you identify, where you work, someone just like you has done something incredible in this movement, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 100 years ago. This movement belongs to you just as much as it belongs to anyone else. And, you know, our future depends on understanding our past and building on the lessons that our forebears set down. So, yeah, the future is yours. The labor movement is yours. And I believe the working class will win. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm inspired. I'm ready to go kidnap my boss. Well, I don't have a <laughs> boss, but if I did have a boss, I'd be out there ready to kidnap them. Here you Kim go. Kelly, <laughs> thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you. Hey, thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of our new videos. Also, if you want to see Means Morning News in its complete form, not just the clips we post here, head on over to Means TV and get access to all our new episodes and our entire backlog plus tons of other great movies, 